This is the lecture discussion for ancient and medieval history for Friday, the 19th of November, 2021. After a week of watching the entirety of the 1997 movie, The Odyssey, we are ready to talk about it, which we will now do. My first question to you is, in what ways were, was Queen Penelope faithful to Odysseus? In what ways, Dan? Uh, by not remarrying. She did not remarry. Um, that, um, she followed his. Uh, she followed her promise to that he. That they discussed before he left that um, when their son had a beard on his face that she must remarry. Yes, he made her promise that there was a finite point beyond which she would not wait for him, and that point was when Telemachus had a, his first beard, and she. However reluctantly, because those guys were scum, uh, kept that promise. Uh, she raised his son. She raised his son, which is an act of faith, and she ruled Ithaca to the extent she could after the suitors started arriving. <coughs> so, did she sleep with any other man? No. So she is faithful indeed. Did she ever talk about sleeping with another man, desiring to? No. So she's thoughtful indeed and in words. Did she ever show any indication that, in, even in her mind, she lusted after or wanted another husband other than Odysseus? No. no. So, Penelope, Queen Penelope, was faithful in thought, in word, and in deed. Which is from the old Boy Scout oath. What about Odysseus? In what ways were he faithful? Yep. Um, he never stopped trying to come home, even when he was with these beautiful women. That's right. He continued his quest for home. Yes? That's what I was going to say. Okay. What else? I was going to say basically. So. Yeah. He never forgot about Penelope. He never forgot about her. Did he ever show any signs of wanting to stay with another woman? Okay, yeah. Kind of, on Calypso's Island. You see him dancing and having fun. But, what happened the moment he saw a ship? Well, he tried, he tried to run, yeah. but then it had the time lapse of two years later. Right, but when you are in a hopeless situation, human beings tend to adapt to those situations. If he's stuck on the island, and she proved that he was by sending her sea nymphs after him, um, her handmaidens, and that perfect parade ground Vic formation, um, he might as well adapt to it. The moment he was given a choice to leave, what does he do? He immediately left. He built his raft, oomph, 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 and he, um, and he left. As Calypso is practically begging him, is, it, is she worth it? Is she worth all of this? You're giving up immortality, you're giving up me, you're giving up living like a god. Not many men would do that to go home to their wife. What about Circe? Okay, I've got the same people answering. I'm going to ask for other people to answer, or I will simply pick people. Did Odysseus want Circe? Did he love her? Yes or no? George, no. Uh, he stayed there for what he thought was five days because then she manipulated time. Uh, yeah. He stayed for an entire five years. So right. As soon as she told him that it was five years, he moved. Right. Did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> you can argue. Yes, go ahead. Uh, she was also like manipulating their brains, right? Clouding their judgment. Oh, yeah. Too, so, so she's a sorceress. Yeah. And that's what sorceresses do. She turned his men into animals, and the only way he would get them back is to pleasure her in bed. And he did that, and she sent, she, she, you know, she, she restored his men. But then she says, bring your men here, and we'll celebrate. And Odysseus, like a dumb bottom, says, okay. And for a few days, he dallies in her bed. But while in her bed, who's he thinking of? No. Right. So, obviously, you can't say that Odysseus was faithful indeed. At the very least, 
the story shows that he made love to Circe and to Calypso. However, did Odysseus ever flag in his faithfulness in thought or in word? Yes or no? no. Why? Yes or no and why? Because each time that he was given a chance to leave or any like the slightest chance with even a big danger risk, he would take it. Yeah. I mean, you could argue that he didn't have to dally in Cersei's bed but at no time did he say, "Oh, Cersei's bed is better than home." No, he, you know, he he had a moment of sloppiness. Basically, he wasn't thinking clearly because, in part, she was clouding his judgment, and uh, he lingered in her bed for what he thought was a short period of time—a couple of days. And he was tired. He had, along with his men, fought the Trojan War, and you know, then worked on the ship to try to get home and faced Polyphemus. And got the winds, and we're going to talk about that next. Understand, traditional culture is not necessarily fair or equitable regarding the two genders. Men and women are often held to different standards. For example, a woman is rarely damned for not being brave, physically brave. Women are not traditionally expected to be physically brave. Unless it's a mom defending her kids, in which case, watch out because you're dealing with insane, you know, crazy harpy woman. <laughs> Don't mess with Mama Bear's kids. But except for that extreme case, if there's a threat to the house, you don't expect mom, if dad is around, to grab a club and go fight. That isn't the traditional job of women. Women are the last line of defense protecting the children. A man, on the other hand, is damned for being cowardly. And most men, traditionally, would rather die than be seen as a coward, which means they'd rather step into danger, which may, they may never come out of. It wasn't just that that red-haired suitor who was fat was made fun of because he was fat, the guy from Galicium who, who had many sheep. It was that he had not taken up the duties of a, of a man. He was a merchant prince. He was wealthy. That was his talent. But he didn't keep himself fit or trim. He was not a warrior. He didn't put himself at risk. He didn't fight. He never went to the arena. He never learned how to use weapons. Whereas all the others, who were noblemen, were expected to learn how to use weapons. Uh, Telemachus, when he has his beard, he's a man. Time to enter the arena. Enter into manhood. And that means getting your butt kicked. Because chances are, when you walk into the arena as a, a late teen uh, young man against an adult man who has actual combat experience, you're still going to get thrashed. So men and women are expected to hold different standards when it comes to bravery. The same thing is true as regards fidelity. I am not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's the way things should be. But did Odysseus have any choice but to pleasure Circe or Calypso? This is a question. Think about it. Did he have a real choice to say no to those magic women? Could he have gotten through without it, Jaden? Uh, no. I Why? Don't think so because for his men, for Circe, he had the. Uh... These are in bed, so and he cares about his men. Yeah, he would just leave them. his men would not have been restored had he not made Cersei happy. There was no <coughs> choice. Now you could argue the the remaining time, the the other four and a half days, yeah, that's on him. But he never stopped thinking of, and I think he thought that it was all part and parcel of the same thing that she might turn them back again. But yeah, he had to please her in bed at least once. She made that very clear. So did Hermes, the messenger. What about Calypso? Did he have a choice with her? I think he did have some semblance of a choice. Because the, the first day he was on there, he, you know, they, yeah. Yeah. And I don't think if he was, I don't think he had to have done that, even though he was trapped on the island. You may be right about the first day, but he was waking up from a terrible nightmare. 
and he was he had just lost all of his men and he was alone on this island with this beautiful woman and her maidens who'd never seen a man before giggle 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 you got a point but long term uh, well actually what do you think but i'm calling anybody well, I, yeah, I was about to say I will. um i feel like he kind of had a choice with with calypso because like she didn't really give him any conditions like you have to do this with me otherwise you can't Something like that. She did not make it a condition the way Cersei did. Cersei was quid pro quo, do this for me or your men stay beasties. But again and again, she said, this is my island. Everything on it exists to please me. Odysseus was on her island. He didn't have any way off. You cannot swim across the Mediterranean Sea. This is my island. Everything here exists to please me. Is that not a statement that clarifies Odysseus's position? That while he was there, his duty was to please her, or she would discard him. And then he wouldn't get home. I'm not saying you have to agree. Certainly not. I'm saying that I think it is very arguable that in an unstated way, Circe's demand I'm sorry, Calypso's demands were just as real as Circe's. That Odysseus please her. And also on her island, since she is a sea nymph and this is her domain, maybe his mind was somewhat clouded here as well. I think there's no question Odysseus slept with females. So indeed, Odysseus was not faithful. But in thought and word, Odysseus was, I think, as faithful as you could possibly be under the circumstances. If he wasn't, why would he get the reward at the end? What is the reward at the end? His loving wife, who was faithful to him and thought word empty, because women are held to standards of chastity traditionally that men are not. Why? For what practical reason is this unfair standard maintained throughout most history of history and around most of the world even today? Why is it that a man can be promiscuous in a way that a woman cannot? Why is it more socially acceptable? This is a question of biology. Uh, because women, because women need to be there for like nine months, and men only need to be there for like a minute. Because women give birth. Yeah. A man having sex might father a child, might not. A woman having sex might mother a child, might not. But the man is not physically carrying the baby. The man will not physically nurse the baby. The man's purpose and function in life is different than the woman. A woman that is willing to have the babies of several fathers is traditionally seen very poorly in every society. <coughs> and she is not a desirable mate, and men will not work hard to earn her regard because she is unwilling to protect her motherhood. Rightly or wrongly, fairly or unfairly, the way most men and most women and most societies are built, what a man wants is maybe some experiences, but then to have a bride that is his, his, and only his. And children who are no question his. There's no question about their patrimony. There's no question that she wasn't sleeping around on the side. They are his kids. And the, the way people are built, this is the way societies are. It's not a fair standard, it's not an equitable standard, but it is a standard that if you understand human nature, might seem reasonable to you. In any case, this standard is held up in Homer. Odysseus is considered to be a faithful husband, as Penelope is considered to be a faithful wife under the circumstances. Odysseus in thought and word, Penelope in thought, word and deed. Any thoughts or questions on that before we move on to the bag of wins? 
What is so bad about what the crew did in the bag of winds? Aeolus gives the bag of winds, sends them home. They can see Ithaca, George. Uh, they were sent up. He told them specifically, do not open this bag, like as their king. So, ah, as their king. So, as the king, he has some expectation that his subjects will obey him. Yeah. Damn right. But Odysseus isn't just their king. Dan, what else is he to them? What has he been on the battlefield of the Trojan War? Like their general or master? Yeah, he's their king and their commander. This guy has made choices that have saved the lives of every single one of these guys more than once. Being Odysseus, he probably stepped between them in danger on more than one occasion. They owed him their allegiance as his, because he was their king. And they owed him loyalty because he was their commander in battle and he had kept them alive. He had been faithful to them. On the one hand, you've got Polites. I don't care what it is so long as I get my share. Yeah, that's greed. That's absolute greed. And you have the monkey guy on the other hand. I forget his name. I don't care about my share. I just want to know what it is. I got to know. I'm curious. I'm curious. I'm curious. Well, that's ultimate curiosity. And in both cases, the temptations of greed and of curiosity override the loyalty, not only of those two men, but of the rest of the crew, except for the guy who was almost a tattletale. The tattletale was loyal in that case. I've got to wake the commander. You're not waking the commander. But I've got to wait. It's Ithaca. No. If we get to Ithaca, he'll never tell us what's in the bag. He'll never share what's in the bag. They failed in their trust. They failed in their loyalty. And do you know what that means? And this is going to seem unfair. Odysseus failed as their commander. And as their king. At least on this one occasion, because he did not inspire enough trust or loyalty in his men for them to resist temptation. You know, in the story of Adam and Eve, Eve gets a bad rap because she took, oh, serpent said eat apple, I eat apple, nom, nom, nom. now I know what good and evil is. But it's Adam's failure. Adam was her husband. In Jewish, Christian, and Islamic societies, the husband has authority over the wife. He did not act enough as a husband to give her the strength to resist temptation. It was a failure of Adam's command as the husband that led Eve into temptation. It was a failure of Odysseus to inspire loyalty and devotion in that one occasion, which caused his men to open the bag of winds and doom them. They weren't that late when they first saw Ithaca. Odysseus' mom was still alive. They were just a little late from the rest of the troops who came back from the war. They hadn't met Circe yet. Everything would have been different. But for whatever reason, Odysseus didn't inspire the men enough to resist temptation. And the man, and Athena warned him about this in the boat. She said, I worry about you looking at these men. And she points out Polites greed and, and, and she points out um, the monkey guy's curiosity. The whole point of this is to stress the law of hospitality, which is called Xenia in Greek. And to stress that civilized people do what's right, not what's easy. Again and again. So, any last minute questions or comments before I have you turn in that sheet? Yeah. What traits of Odysseus were exemplified? Like, show, like... Odysseus, okay, exemplified in the story. Odysseus is clever. clever. He is loyal. He is, here's a lovely word for vocab, indefigable, or indefatigable, indefatigable, indefigable. It means not able to be tired. So Odysseus is clever. He comes up with the Trojan horse. And again and again, he, he, he thinks his way through problems. He thinks his way out of the polyphemous cave. He is loyal. He wants to go home to his wife. He wants his uh, Greek side to win, and he is indefigable in that he cannot, he is tireless. He is tireless in pursuit of what he cares about. He does not say, ah, it's too much, I'm done. No, he, he keeps going and going 
like the Energizer Bunny, which is a reference you may or may not get. Okay. Uh, if you have the worksheet done now, make sure your name is on it and tear it out of your notes and turn it in. If you don't have it done, get it in by three today. Yes. Uh, how did you like, get another like, heart of stone? If a heart, if stone can bleed. Uh, yeah, remember. Uh, her daughter in law called her, said she had a heart of stone, but no. The Queen Mother was tough in the old style way. Yeah. Um, I, I couldn't remember or recall what Trixius say about the importance of their Odysseus. Yoda says the same thing to Luke. Always your mind on the future, never on where you are, what you are doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seresius says the same thing. We don't live our lives in the destination. We live our lives in the journey. It's the journey that counts. Odysseus, you better start paying attention to what's going on right now or you're never going to learn anything. And since the whole point was to prove to Poseidon that Odysseus had learned maybe that without the gods a man is nothing, he needs to start thinking, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Now we're going to talk about Thanksgiving, which we're having a week of vacation for, starting at 2.45 today. <laughs> First off, I'm looking forward to it. Most people have a picture of Thanksgiving that's a little different from what I'm about to read to you. This is from the radio talk show host, Rush Limbaugh, Ultimate Conservative. But it's a true story about Thanksgiving that isn't told much by left-wing teachers or in left-wing schools. Listen to the story, and as an extra credit, you can, if you want, research the first Thanksgiving yourself and write your own one-page analysis on the meaning of it, significance of it. So this is one man's opinion, but it's also strongly grounded in historical truth. From Rush Limbaugh's show on November 21st, 2007, and he had said this before, I heard this back in the 90s. Now, the real story of Thanksgiving. On August 1st, 1620, the Mayflower set sail. It carried a total of 102 passengers, including 40 pilgrims led by William Bradford. On the journey, Bradford set up an agreement a contract that established just and equal laws for all members of the new community, irrespective of their religious beliefs. Where did the revolutionary ideas expressed in the Mayflower Compact come from? From the Bible. The pilgrims were a people completely steeped in the lessons of the Old and New Testaments. They looked to the ancient Israelites for their example, and because of the biblical precedent set forth in Scripture, they never doubted that their experiment would work. But this was no pleasure cruise. <coughs> the journey to the New World was a long and arduous one. And when the pilgrims landed in New England in November, <laughs> they found, according to Bradford's detailed journal, a cold, barren, desolate wilderness. There were no friends to greet them, he wrote. There were no houses to shelter them. There was no there were no inns where let's see. There were no inns where they could refresh themselves. And the sacrifice that they had made for freedom was just beginning. During the first winter, half the pilgrims, including Bradford's own wife, died of either starvation, sickness, or exposure. When spring finally came, Indians taught the settlers how to plant corn, fish for cod, and skin beavers for coats. Life improved for the pilgrims, but they did not yet prosper. This is because, this is important, should I say, to understand, because this is where modern American history lessons often end. Thanksgiving is actually experienced explained in some textbooks as a holiday for which the pilgrims gave thanks to the Indians for saving their lives, rather than as a devout expression of gratitude grounded in the traditions of both the Old and New Testaments. Here is the part that has been omitted. The original contract the pilgrims had entered into with their merchant sponsors in London called for everything they produced to go into a common store and each member of the community was entitled to one common share. All of the land they cleared and the houses they built 
belonged to the community as well. Bradford, who had become the new governor of the colony, recognized that this form of collectivism was as costly and destructive to the pilgrims as their, that first harsh winter, which had taken so many lives. He decided to take bold action. Bradford assigned a plot of land to each family to work and manage, thus turning loose the power of the marketplace. Long before Karl Marx was even born, the pilgrims had discovered and experimented with what could only be described as socialism. And what happened? It didn't work. Surprise! What Bradford and his community found was that the most creative and industrious people had no incentive to work any harder than anyone else unless they could utilize the power of personal motivation. But while most of the rest of the world has been experimenting with socialism for well over a hundred years, trying to refine it, perfect it, and reinvent it, the pilgrims decided early on to scrap it permanently. What Bradford wrote about this social experiment should be in every school child's history lesson. If it were, we might prevent much needless suffering in the future. Here's what he wrote, quote, The experience that we had in this common course and condition tried sundry years that by taking away property and bringing community into the commonwealth would make them happy and flourishing as if they were wiser than God? For this community so far as it was, was found to breed much confusion and discontent and retard much employment that would have been to their benefit and comfort for young men that were most able and fit for labor and service did repine that they should spend their time and strength to work for another man's wife and children without any recompense. That was thought to be injustice. Have you, Rush goes on, do you hear what he's saying? The pilgrims found that people could not be expected to do their best work without incentive. So what did Bradford's community try next? They unleashed the power of good old free enterprise by invoking the undergirding capitalistic principle of private property. Every family was assigned its own plot of land to work and permitted to mark its own crops, market its own crops and products. And what was the result? Quote, this had very great good success, wrote Bradford, for it made all hands industrious so that so as much more corn was planted than otherwise would have been, unquote. The profits awaited them to pay off their debts to the merchants in London, and the success and prosperity of the Plymouth settlement attracted more Europeans to begin what became known as the Great Puritan Migration. Now, aside from this radio program, <coughs> have you ever heard of this? Well, good for you. And if not, why not? I mean, is there a more important lesson one could derive from the Pilgrim experience than that? So the Pilgrims decided to thank God for all their good fortune. And that's Thanksgiving. Read George Washington's first Thanksgiving address and count the number of times God is mentioned and how many times he is thanked. None of this is taught today. It should be. Have a happy Thanksgiving. You deserve it. Do what you can to be happy, and especially do what you can to be thankful. Because in this country, you have more reasons than you've ever stopped to think about. On the flip side is George Washington's address on Thanksgiving and the Mayflower Compact, both of which are referenced. So, Emma, you've heard of this. Good. Most of you, well, let's see. Have any of you heard this part of the story before? If you have, please raise your hand. Okay, that's a, a few, couple few of you. Most have not, because it doesn't fit the narrative. Human beings understand intuitively what is mine, what is yours, what is ours, what is theirs. And if you mess with that, it's like telling little kids who are playing baseball or soccer or kickball not to keep score, because we don't want to make the losers sad. Kids always keep score. Yeah. That's life. And if you deny human nature for the sake of some idealistic experiment, you're actually going to make it harder for human beings to function in whatever paradise you build. Ladies and gentlemen, have a happy Thanksgiving. Take care.